Okay, so today I'm going to cover the pancreas and some hormones it produces, and then I'll touch a little bit on type 1 and type 2 diabetes and how it relates. And so uh, the pancreas, 99% of the cells are these acini cells, and those are cells that are digestive cells. In other words, they produce digestive juices. So those 99% of those cells are an exocrine gland, which we'll talk about in a post when I talk about digestion. But I want to focus today on 1% of the cells that are called pancreatic islets or the islets of Langerhans. And they're made up of two types of cells. We have the alpha cells and we have the beta cells. And the alpha cells produce a hormone called glucagon. The beta cells produce a hormone called insulin. And uh, I'm not going to get too specific, but I'm going to give you some basics here and focus on the, the key thing which I want to focus on today, which is the blood sugar portion. And glucagon's function, it's really a sole function for glucagon at least, uh, is to increase blood sugar. It does use several mechanisms to get that done, but its, its function is to increase the blood sugar. Insulin, its function is to lower blood sugar. It does that by helping shuttle the sugar inside of the glucose inside the cells. And so um, insulin has many other functions. It's an anabolic hormone, increasing protein synthesis. It also plays a role in memory. And you know, I won't go down a bunny trail of functions here, but the, the key function I wanna focus on today, as I said, is that lowering of the blood sugar. So these are antagonistic hormones. Glucagon, produced by those alpha cells, are, is going to raise blood sugar when needed, right? So if blood sugar gets low, it's gonna help us raise blood sugar. And insulin is going to lower blood sugar if the blood sugar spikes or gets higher or starts to increase, okay? So the goal is to maintain homeostasis or that dynamic, that dynamic equilibrium or dynamic balance of blood sugar, right? Keeping it within those normal limits. So. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about insulin. So now I've talked in another, another post about how hormones have to bind to the receptor in order to stimulate right, the function that they're designed for. And so if it doesn't bind to the receptor, then it doesn't cause the effect. So we have two types of diabetes. You have type 1 diabetes mellitus and type 2 diabetes mellitus. People get confused, they're like, which one's the mellitus? They both are. There's two types, okay? Diabetes type 1 mellitus, diabetes type 2 mellitus. And so type one is genetic, and uh, that one is uh, called insulin dependent because it's a failure of the pancreatic cells to produce insulin. And this one is actually an autoimmune disease. So the body uh, attacks self. We can talk about this in the immune system chapters, but the body attacks self and destroys those beta cells, okay? And so uh, what's gonna happen is they're not gonna be able to produce insulin in those individuals, and they're, they're insulin dependent. They're gonna need to take insulin, okay? Uh, in type two diabetes, which is actually much more common, type two diabetes is the loss of ability to bind insulin to the receptors and or, if it progresses, the ability to produce insulin as well as it causes failure of those beta cells. And so, but that one's over time. And so the, um, the Regardless of which type of diabetes, I want, to, I want to focus at this point, though, on the, um, the insulin-resistant diabetes, which is type 2, okay? That insulin resistance, here's what that means. Think of it this way to remember it. It resists binding, right? It resists binding to the receptors. So insulin resistance is the inability to bind well to the receptors, which means it's the inability of insulin to do its job well because it can't bind to the receptor, so it's not able to get the sugar into the cells. And then there's a cascade of effects that happen from there that probably diabetes would be a good post to do at some point in the future. And so, um, so focusing on insulin, if we get insulin to bind better to the receptor, and there are things that do this, and it's fortunate because I, I do, you know, coach a lot of weightlifting and, and nutrition, talk about a lot of nutrition, things like that. And so uh, good nutrition, okay, um, as well as exercise, is going to increase insulin sensitivity. Well, what's insulin sensitivity? Well, it's the opposite of insulin resistance. Insulin sensitivity is the ability of insulin to bind well to the receptor. So exercise actually prevents type two diabetes, good nutrition, and again, that, that, that's kind of a, a, a giant black hole of things we can talk about there when we talk about good nutrition. But good nutrition as it pertains to blood sugar also can help increase insulin sensitivity and the binding of insulin to the receptors. So again, it's preventative for type 2 diabetes, as well as helping uh, someone that either has prediabetes or someone that actually has type 2 diabetes. These are all good strategies to help get insulin to bind better to the receptor. If it does bind to the receptor, then it helps shuttle that sugar into the cells. Now here's the thing. If you don't get the sugar in the cells, 
you can't use the sugar for energy, which is why people that have unregulated diabetes, regardless of which type, if, they have, if it's not regulated and treated properly, they're using primarily fatty acids for fuel, they build up ketone bodies, ketone bodies are acidic, and they can end up not only with ketosis, which is lots of ketones in the blood, but if that progresses because they're acidic and it actually changes the overall pH of the blood to get to the point of acidosis, which is under 7.35, uh, it's considered acidosis in, in, the, in human physiology. If it does that, then it's called ketoacidosis, if the cause is from the buildup of those ketone bodies. Anyway, there's a little extra fun fact for you. If you have any questions, let me know. Stay strong. I'll see you next time.